What's going on, everybody, and welcome to the other side of the firewall podcast, where we talk about the latest and greatest in cybersecurity news, as well as we highlight those movers and shakers and glass ceiling breakers, those people of color who made it to the other side of the proverbial firewall. My name is Ryan Williams, and as always, I'm joined by Shannon Times. What's up? What's up? What's going on? And special guest for the whole week. So please go back and listen to the episodes. Uh, I don't know the numbers. Mondays and Tuesdays episodes <laughs> this week. Uh, we have Michael Ware returning to the show. How are you doing? Greetings and salutations. What is going on? So you are the Chief Information Officer of North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, you've been there for uh, roughly seven years or so. Uh, and we definitely are uh, excited to have you on the show, and we definitely want to talk about this uh, topic um, when it comes to, um, I think you phrased it, um, environment, environmental injustice. So environmental please injustice. Me, yeah, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we definitely want to get into uh, into this discussion. I think we'll have a lot of uh, good points to, uh, uh, a lot of good questions to ask you, but I think you'll cover a lot of good points uh, in this. So without further ado, I'll give it to you. Yeah, so thanks. I'm very excited to be to be back on. Um, I listen to you all the time. So on the on the way to work, so I don't get a I get I don't get the comment on uh, on anything while I'm driving. So um, yeah, I've been with um, North Carolina, the state of North Carolina, since 2014, and then um, at two years in in 2016, I was assigned as the CIO for the Department of Environmental Quality. And I mean, the Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, a lot of our job is to um, to issue permits, and um, and this is permitting how much pollution you put out into the environment. So it's a you, we're giving you a license to pollute, but only a little bit. And if you ex, you if you go beyond that, then there's a consequence. Um, so when I when I got to the agency, um, we had uh, Secretary uh, Michael Regan. He was the Secretary for Department of Environmental Quality. I'll say DEQ from here on out. Um, in, in a fun fact, right now he, um, when he left DEQ, he is now the head of the EPA for the United States. So he's the EPA administrator um, yeah. for the U.S. Okay. So one of the initiatives that he had, which I, I found fascinating, was environmental justice. I did not know what this was. Um, so what this is is you can imagine uh, North Carolina. We'll do some some visuals in your head and um and some vernacular so um we'll start with the vernacular so a hog lagoon that is a very nice term for where the urine and feces go from hogs so hog lagoon um you have air then we have waste and when we talk about waste we're talking about animals landfills um underground storage tank which is uh basically your gas gas tanks underneath the convenience uh, the gas stations dry cleaners and then water, of course. So for water, you have wastewater, storm water, which is the water that comes in and then goes down the drains. And then you have your drinking water. So those are some of the things. So what happens is you have a town. So imagine Stardew Valley, right? You've got this nice little town and um, and a factory comes in and says, we're going to put some, some smoke, some, we're going to make some stuff and we're going to pollute the air. And the air division will say, okay, you're, you're good. You, you're only going to pollute so much and it's within all the regulations. And they're like, great, thanks. Then, um, you know, a farmer will come in and say, we're going to put a hog farm here. And the waste section will say, you've met all the, all the check boxes, you're fine. And then some other factory is going to be up the river and they're going to put some chemicals in the water. And we look at that and they're like, okay, yep, it, you're going to put these chemicals in, but it's all underneath the, you know, what we're allowing, the the um, the water treatment plant downstream can handle all this stuff that you're putting in the water, so so you're good. And then um, then another farmer is going to say, hey, you know what's really good for the, this this wheat field is um, manure. You know, a great place to get that is this this hog lagoon, and we just put it into the water, and and they actually use that in the in the sprinkler. Right, and and put it out into the field. You can imagine that may not smell great. Now, each one of these activities met all the requirements, federal law, state law, and all the regulations. However, now Stardew Valley has all of these things in it. Um, and so when you look at them individually, 
they don't add up um, to any anything that's wrong. But when you look at it collectively, what you have done to this Stardew Valley is you now the stink from the hog farm and the fertilizer that's being sprayed out, then the air pollution, and then the water coming downstream. Now you you have you have really kind of put too much into this. And imagine it's not just one air point of pollution or one water pollution. There's there's quite a few. And so trying to look at that. Now, what happens is if the people of that town will say, we don't like this, but they do not, they're, they're generally underrepresented um, and under the poverty level. So they don't have any monetary means or political means to really push back. And so, um, so you'll just get a whole bunch of things. So what we do is we have we have a GIS team, and what we started to is, is trying to work with the um, divisions that put maps together. And I think um, one of the things that I saw that's not a public product, so I, um, there's, I can't share this, but can you imagine state of North Carolina and you have a map, and then you look at the map and you like, okay, all these areas in the in the dark um, brown areas, these are places that are under the poverty line. Then if you take now, North Carolina is one of the, the leading places in the U.S. for hog farms. And you take a layer and put all the hog farms on top of North, that same map, they're all going to be in those areas that are in the poverty line. Gotcha. And so, um, and that's just, it's just not, so that's environmental justice is trying to prevent that, you know, those individual actions that collectively really hurt a town. And, um, and, and kind of legally, there's, it's not being focused at. So Secretary Regan actually pushed that. And um, it was surprising because I did not know or even think about this uh, before. Now I'm IT, but still. Um, but some of our businesses hadn't given some thought before. So basically that's what um, environmental justice is, uh, trying to make sure that we're, we're not putting too much into a town that, you know, um, that doesn't have the means to, to protect itself. What do you think, Shannon? So uh, that, that is interesting, right? So like, with this discussion, so <clears throat> it sounds like there is also some complicity from from the local government, you know what I mean, whether it be a mayor or whatever, right? Like, it, I don't imagine this would happen without someone on a city council or something like that saying, yes, we're good with that, but put it in this area, you know what I mean? Like, um, I, I, and, and you said that they don't have, they don't have the ability to fight it politically either, right? So like, I, I hear you on that because like if it comes to you like say for whatever reason the mayor's like yes I do want this to happen it's going to happen over here you may have to wait you know two years just two years into a four-year term you have to wait two years you know to get them out of there but the damage has already been done at that point you know what I mean like and and, and this being addressed at a federal level because you were saying that uh what, what was the gentleman's name again Egan was, was uh Secretary Michael Regan 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 so him starting there where you were when you started in at a federal level like the fact that it's going to get addressed at a federal level I mean that's great but like here, here's the thing he, he's secretary and he's working for the EPA now but administrations change right what's to say that if for whatever reason he's not there anymore right it that goal is going to change you know when the next person comes in it may not be a priority for them for the EPA to address this which seems like it's a very important thing because the thing is I imagine this isn't just happening in in North Carolina as a matter of fact I know it's not happening in North Carolina because I was looking at an article recently and it had to deal with uh Elon Musk down in Texas and they were kind of doing the same thing because he's building like factories and whatnot down there and there's a town that's adjacent to him to where you know they're trying to do all these things environmentally the town is like no we don't want you to do that we already have it was for water treatment. It's a little bit different, but it's for water treatment. And they're like, we already have a water treatment plant that we put in not that long ago. Why aren't you using that? And then there's all types of excuses and things like that. But we already know, you know, again, I don't want to get into politics, but we know the governor very much invited Elon down there to be like, hey, come bring your business here and and, and you'll prosper. You know what I mean? And they're just having problems. They're having problems de dealing with his company, trying to get them to comply like they need to when it comes to environmental things. So, yeah, this is this is definitely going to be a problem that, that needs to be dealt with and is is going as as we start looking as we start looking around the nation now, like it's one of those things where we have these companies that are getting bigger and bigger. And then they want to go to all these different places like they want to expand, you know what I mean? So like right. they, they, well, they, they, they want to expand to places that are cheap. Right? Exactly. So you're exactly. Property that's very inexpensive. Yep. 
And yes. then what do you do? Like in, in your case, you say Elon is wants to build, you know, uh, uh, another water treatment plant, probably because of uh, like I'm, I'm big into EVs. Like I don't have one yet, but I do want one. But I, I understand that the, the waste that comes from uh, manufacturing, you know, humongous batteries is not great for the environment. Right. Uh, and it comes at a cost. Right. Like especially to ship those precious minerals from other countries. Right. You're, you're doing more pollution than you're solving uh, sometimes. And I'm sure they'll, they'll get better at it. But if you invite Elon anywhere, that's on you <laughs> because he's going to do what he wants to do. But uh, so I, I did I did hear of this, but not this uh, specific, specific initiative. Like we kind of talked about it offline uh, where I read an article uh, a few years back um, that dealt with uh, nuclear waste. Right. So like when they move nuclear waste from a nuclear power plant, uh, I guess when, when, when rods are ex expended or I, I don't know, I'm not a physicist. Uh, <laughs> but when the waste material needs to be removed from the uh, the factory, they encase it in cement. They call it wishbone because of its shape. It looks like a wishbone. Um, they ship it by via freight or whatever. Um, it does not go through affluent affluent neighborhoods. They do not want it because like, what if it breaks down? What if it were to fall off the uh, the truck? What if someone were to attack it because it comes a dirty bomb? So they, they usually send it through poverty areas, and I thought that was crazy. Because again, like you uh, you said, uh, Mike, those people are not uh, typically their constituents. They don't they don't have a say. They don't have a vote. Uh, they don't have that. They're kind of powerless. So let's send it through that neighborhood because you're going to get less pushback uh, as opposed to sending it through uh, the suburbs where they're like, no, you absolutely not ship this thing, which should be safe, right? Uh, because it meets all federal regulations. It's encased in concrete. Uh, but even just the thought of something happening that is very unlikely they're like no you're not you're not going to take this particular route you'll go out of your way to go through the poor neighborhood than to come through the rich neighborhood um so it's good to see that the, this initiative is, is actually happening I, I i did catch your stardew uh, valley reference i i, I have to bring that up <laughs> good yeah. job sir um so it, it's crazy that um it has to exist right like no one's put the like because i'm sure uh people in high places did put the map together in their head like it would absolutely not go through my constituents constituents neighborhoods that will go here um but no one has collectively taken all that information and like you said made a map where it shows concentration like okay like everything is going here like it may be good uh it may meet federal regula regulations uh however concentration and, and not only that but who wants to live uh when i was in mountain home who wants to live by the simplot uh farm right like <laughs> right like when the when the wind would shift and you can you could smell the hog farm you're like i don't want to live here i don't want to buy property here because it, it's like living next to a paper mill no one wants that either um and typically those are not in suburbs right like you're not going to build a paper mill uh around a million dollar homes it's not going to happen because it's going to take down the property value uh, and those people will complain. Um, so not, so that's, that's great uh, that that you're actually able to, to do something about it. But like Shannon said, hopefully it continues. Like we talked about last episode with budget cuts, right? Hopefully the, those don't don't creep in. Because yeah, nobody wants to live in an area that is concentrated with uh, wastewater, things of that nature. So I'm glad someone is paying attention as opposed to everybody, you know, covering their eyes up. Um, my question would be, um, has has that allowed the um, stoppage of things being built, right? Like, has anybody uh, in your time there seen the concentration? Like, okay, we want to put another, uh, like, some sort of waste. Like like you said, you called it a hog lagoon, which hog lagoon. It, it, it blows my mind how they make these names up to cover up <laughs> <laughs> things that people don't want. <laughs> has it ever worked in, in the, the favor of that area where it's like, no, you can't build another one of these? So I... Uh... I cannot answer that. Um, gotcha. Again, I. But it's being monitored. Yeah, I I don't do the um, I don't do the permitting, and um, gotcha. and there's also very heavy political slant on this, um, but we do make sure that we support the tools, GIS tools. You know, that's that that's kind of my my thing. But um, when we talk about environmental quality, this is one of the things. Um, again, I I think. I wanted to to talk about this oh, as a subject um because I had not thought about it not that I think I'm I'm super brilliant or anything but it's amazing to me how 
I'm half a century old and I had not, you know, I this has never even crossed my mind. Now yeah. I'm not an environmentalist, but when I heard about it, I was like, oh yeah, that that seems like something we should look at. Right. Um, so yeah. And, and, and I think that that is becoming more um, prevalent, right? I, I know I'm being uh, uh, optimistic and what have you, but I, I've seen uh, lots of articles and, and documentaries where people are actually going through and trying to figure out um, what, is, what is going on in these areas, like uh, where I grew up, right? So I'm from Buffalo, New York. Uh, I currently live in Florida. But where I grew up, um, we had to, like I remember it, like really early as a child, uh, walk with my grandmother to the bank, right? There was no banks in our area. This is something that you don't really think about. Um, but like my area was nothing but, you know, check cashing places and there were no payday loans yet. I don't think that existed. But now if I go back home, that is the case. And the areas that weren't I, like, so there's, there's, the area is becoming gentrified, right? So I grew up in what's called the Kensington Langfield Projects, Ken Lane Projects in Buffalo uh, is where I, I, I grew up for a decade in my life. There were no banks. There were no uh, um, no supermarkets. There were no, a lot of things in that area. Uh, we, we now we nowadays we have a name for it. We call it the food desert, right? Where you don't have uh, uh, access to produce and things of that nature. You just have a bunch of dollar trees, um, dollar yeah, street. yeah, restaurant like not even restaurant like fast food places, check casting places, liquor stores, things of that nature. Uh, now we have titles for it, but back then it was just uh, uh, opportunity, right? Like um, they try, like some people try to phrase it like, well, they they bring in business for the things that people want. Uh, but that's not always the case. Like you talk about the the hog lagoons and things of that nature. Uh, no, these like these areas are taken advantage of. Like as opposed to because uh, we still needed a bank. Like it wasn't like we didn't need to go to the bank. We just had to walk a couple miles to get to it, right? But there was a check cashing place that was you know would take a portion of your check if you try to cash it there, as opposed to in, in, invest and save it in the area, right? It's target of opportunity. They're like, well, we can take advantage of this scenario, and you know, do X, Y, and Z. Now in the uh, the 2020s, like there's a spotlight on it, right? Like there, people are bringing it to people's attention. Like how come there's no Whole Foods in these areas? Like you see maps that are inverse. You see all the Whole Foods or you see all of the Trader Joe's or whatever else you want to call. Uh, you'll see the, the exact opposite. You'll see a dark concentration uh, in the affluent areas or the suburbs. And you'll see these huge, uh, white space when it comes to the inner city. Um, and now this is coming to, to more of the forefront. So it's good to see that initiatives, initiatives like this are being uh, done by the federal government, uh, as well as social media starting to pick up on it. Like you're seeing a lot more articles, you're seeing a lot more conversation. Uh, and in some cases, uh, I've seen where a few communities are, are bringing in um, local business, like they're, uh, they're creating um, uh, small businesses that, that deal in produce or they, uh, they're they bringing in smaller banks, right? It's not the big banks, but it's something that's uh, uh, able to thrive more in that community because nobody wants to walk two miles to cash a check, right? That's, that's not what you, I mean, now there's direct deposit, right? So technology has also helped. But but back then, I, I remember uh, my mom getting her first debit card because they, they didn't exist before. You literally had to go all the way to a bank. There was no online banking, there were no debit cards. ATM machines were just now starting to come to fruition. I'm, oh man, I'm old. <laughs> no, if you wanted to go out on the weekend, you had to cash a check on Friday. Yeah, yeah. Or you had no cash on, on the weekend. Yeah, so it's good to see that people are paying attention like, uh, to, to try to to fix some of these scenarios. And technology is also advancing it, right? Uh, like you said, you, you support the tools that make it happen where they can map these things out and kind of figure out uh, what is going on and what people are trying to get away with. Um, not necessarily because they're trying to be nefarious, but I, I need to build my hog farm and then this is the only place they'll let me put it. Um, so I don't care. Like I need to build my hog farm. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I, I gotta be careful talking about any kind of, any, any kind of politics, but I, I don't think the hog farmers are malicious either. Right. It's just, you know, we have set up a system that, that has, that this is one of the, you know, the things that has happened, the consequences of of all those actions, right? The second and third, order, second and third order effects. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I'm not trying to blame them. They're trying to make a living as well. But uh, like you said, like the system is designed to like we're not going to put it over here where people live in, you know, five hundred thousand to million dollar homes. We're going to put it down here, uh, where where people won't won't have the ability to shout as loudly. Um, for, for having this thing set up. So no, I, I thank you for bringing it to our attention. I, I think it, it brings up a, a lot of 
interesting points. And uh, as well as when you have a name for things, it helps you to identify it, right? It, uh, I, I, I cannot quote it because I can't remember, but it's like an Orwellian quote where um, uh, he was talking about language, right? We use less words than we ever used before. So like, uh, you know, 100 years ago, they used to use 10,000 more words. They're way more descriptive. Uh, but as uh, time went on, we're starting to lose the ability to have uh, dialogue about things because we don't, simply don't have the, the vocabulary to speak about it. Um, so it's good to see uh, some people will say, you know, people are, are getting too um, too conscious about things or people are, are, are driving the point home too much or they're complaining too much, yada, yada, yada. But if you don't have a name for something, so now we, we have food deserts, we have uh, uh, pollution and justice, like we, we have titles and names for things so that way we can describe them and, and you can express to someone that this is not right. So I think it's a, a great initiative. And just on the off chance that um, the current secretary, Elizabeth Byler, watches or listens to this, I do want to say when Secretary Regan went up to the MPA, um, she hit it just as hard, if not harder, to continue to support environmental justice. So yeah, the, awesome. uh, you know, the, the changes in the leadership at DEQ are still committed. Uh, to this effort. Now, that's, that's what awesome. happens at the governor level and higher? <laughs> that is what it is. Right, right. That, people need to, need to go out and vote, right? Like we always talk about that as well, like not on this show, but just in general, like pe more people vote for American Idol than they vote for their uh, their local government, which it blows my mind, right? Uh, I, I I shy away from politics. Like this, this upcoming year is gonna be rough. Like TV will be nothing but politics, but you have to pay attention. Like if you're not paying attention, then you can't make, uh, any type of change so you know it is what it is but i, I appreciate you thinking that somebody's going to listen to the show <laughs> <laughs> of of such a thread. i always joke like, like we have like five listeners you being one of them right but uh, <laughs> we do have a, a few more <laughs> than five um but yeah uh thank you for for definitely coming on the show we appreciate um your employer for allowing you to come on and, and speak to us about such matters and initiatives um, actually, we could squeeze one more in uh, if you have the time. I know you wanted to, to potentially talk about uh, being, bringing broadband, blah, I can't speak, bringing broadband to rural areas. So we can talk about that for a couple minutes as well. Okay, so um, so I'm the, I'm the CIO for Department of Environmental Quality. So I, I do all the IT for that agency. That I am assigned or I'm employed by the Department of Information Technology. And one of the things that they're working on just to highlight what we're doing in, in North Carolina, um, is we have a broadband office. So as you are very well aware, um, COVID showed us a lot of things um, on a number of different levels. But one of the things was remote work. Yay, good, for the most part, right? Unless you're in a rural area that didn't have any, you know, high-speed internet access. So, um, we know during COVID we had remote work and we had remote school. And unfortunately uh, in, in North Carolina, there's a lot of areas where those kids could not, um, they had to go to a library, go outside of Starbucks, go to a McDonald's um, to connect. And then what we found was um, in some areas, you know, people couldn't afford a device um, where I know some, some money got pumped into schools to give out like Chromebooks. I know in North Carolina, Chromebooks was a, was a big thing. But um, so there were a lot of gaps. So we like, okay, we, we got some of this stuff figured out, but now, now we, we realize that there's this huge gap. So there's, you know, the broadband initiative and that, that was taken off, but with um, ARPA, America, American Rescue Plan Act, uh, that provided at least North Carolina, $1.3 billion, $1 billion, excuse me, uh, to support infrastructure and grants uh, for broadband. And so our broadband office has um, really been taken off on that one is not only is it for the infrastructure to provide it, but also um, for helping people with devices, paying their, um, their monthly uh, connection, and also a literacy program, which is 50 billion or 50 million with an M, 50 million for digital literacy. And um, now I've not seen any of those plans um, that's, I'm not deep into the details of that, but um, that is for some of the older generation um, who 
you know, I mean, we're getting, you know, uh, social engineered and, um, and scammed, right? That, that That is a big deal. And, um, and then also basically like, this is a computer, this is the internet, this is how you connect and then, you know, you can get online. So um, I'm very happy with how that's going. We, we, you know, taking advantage of a lot of the money that the, that the federal government gave. And, um, you know, I sat on quite a few of these things and it's, it's very hard. Like you can throw money at it, but you need um, a, a community. So we need the private sector to, to come together. And so it's not just grants, but trying to give grants and opportunities for the private sector to say, I'm not going to build infrastructure in this area. There's no money in it for me. So how can, well, we give you some money to subsidize some of that. Um, taking to, I think it's 150, if you're 150% below the, above the po poverty level. Sorry, I, sh I should have got that straight <laughs> earlier. Um, and targeted groups can get um, grants for, for either subsidizing or completely paying for their internet connection or at least, um, and then dropping it down to $30 per month. There's a whole list of groups, uh, veterans, um, elderly, uh, people in poverty. So there's a whole lot of things going on there um, to try to improve that gap. And, um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty proud to work for the state that's, that's doing that, um, and at least trying to tackle that. No, that's a great initiative. So I, I didn't even uh, think about it um, until I think it was last year it's either last year or a year and a half ago um so the pandemic hit i'm in florida with my family uh they shut schools down florida did not close down as much as uh some states right like uh they they stayed relatively open but we were like no if i don't have to leave the house i'm not going to and i was still in the military at the time my tra my job was to travel um obviously there was no more travel right i came back home from israel uh and like right when it happened, like it was like January and then February is when they figured out like, oh, COVID is here. Um, so it came to a screeching halt. So like all of my trips, I, I believe probably for a week, every month, month and a half, all that was shut down. So my workload went down to like a quarter of what I'm just writing reports at this point, right? Just trying to book um, exercises for the following year thinking COVID will be over. Like, oh, COVID, six months. Like that was not the case. <laughs> but so I, I, I say that because I was privileged enough to be able to stay home with the kids who had to flip to remote school. Um, and uh, my youngest uh, was a first grader. Yeah, I think he was, no, he was he was a kindergartner. Yeah, so I wanna say it was kindergarten was remote and that was super tough. And he had, we had, like I said, we're privileged, right? So um, he has a tablet he can work off, right? So I can sit next to him, I'll have my laptop. He has his tablet. Uh, our internet's like 400 by 400. So plenty of speed, no issues. I cannot imagine not having access and having to, uh, because what I learned was, A, I, could, I don't have the patience to teach children. So because the, the teacher can only do so much, then you have to actually assist, right? So like I'm struggling because I know how math works, but I don't know the mechanics of teaching a child math. <laughs> like it's extremely, like shout out to teachers. Like they need to be paid so much more money than they're being paid. But the frustration of your child who is trying to pick up the mechanics and you not able to teach like the teacher can teach, right? Um, I can only see how that can be exasperated by not having access to even do it from your home, right? I need to go, like you said, to a Starbucks or to a library. Like, um, so that, like you, like you, like you said, COVID taught us a lot. Like, like that's definitely something that need need to be pushed because I can't imagine uh, that being a good experience for children. Uh, or in in the case like I was able to work from home. Like, if you're not able to work from home, do you just go to work and get sick? Like, how does that work, right? Um, because you you don't have um, broadband in your home. Um, I can't even imagine. I can't even remember not having broadband. I would have to go all the way back to my first duty uh, station, Mount Home uh, Air Force Base in Idaho. They had ADSL. It is the it is so slow, <laughs> uh, comparatively, right? Like now, like I said, like we're just we got uh, Wi Fi in the house. Uh, I can't imagine not having that in my home readily available uh, for an affordable price. So that, that's a, a huge initiative, um, and that would probably open up opportunities, uh, like not only for for school, but also, like you said, 
uh, for remote work. Like you have people who will be able to, to, you know, do it from home. I don't want to take uh, uh, everything. I'll give it to Shannon. <laughs> no, no, no. You're, you were going down a, you were going down a good path and a path that I was going to venture into as well. Like, so for the school thing, like, yes, that was something that affected a lot of children just didn't have the resources like you were talking about, Mike, you know what I mean? Um, but also um, for people, e e not just to remote work, but to even seek out job opportunities. Cause now how do you do it? You don't go to an unemployment office, walk into yeah. an unemployment office and do paper. You do it all online, right? Um, and when it comes to rural areas, these are areas that have lost whatever may have been their livelihood, you know, whether it be coal mines or something that was more along the lines that we are not seeing as much of in America, you know what I mean? So um, it, it, there, there has been there has been a push, you know, from the current administration. Again, I, I, I've said this every episode now, I don't want to get into politics, but to push um, new skills in these different rural areas that are suffered from losing, you know, whatever they may have been been doing, mining of any type of minerals or coal or whatever, um, for them to get kind of into the 21st century. So in order to do that, you have to provide them with broadband so they're able to do that. So they are able to, whether it be work remotely or to even apply for those jobs, you know, or to to be in a situation where you can attract these big companies that are like, I don't want to go there. There's nothing there. You know, it's a town of 5,000 people. Well, I don't want to invest there. You know what I mean? But if you start bringing broadband in, there's more that they can do for those big corporations to make it worth their time, you know? Yeah, definitely. Just when it comes to training uh, 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 interviews, like people don't interview in real life anymore, right? Uh, they, they do, but I'm just saying like, for the most part, a lot of your interviews are conducted online. So to say that, hey, I don't have it, like, does that hurt you in the in the interview process? Um, and then um, I, was, I was actually, oh, uh, like to call back something I talked about uh, way back at the beginning of the show, online banking and investing, right? If you don't have the means to, uh, to uh, you know, access your money from a direct deposit and things of that nature easily, you know, uh, that, that, that's a, also a, a, a privilege that we have having broadband and things of that nature. Um, and then uh, I, I did like that you brought up uh, uh, literacy. So uh, the reason that I was going to say uh, I, this didn't come to my attention until a, a year, year and a half ago is uh, I, I taught um, I taught a introduction to uh, networking and um, uh, networking and IT for business course when I was uh, uh, over in Turkey for uh, for UMGC. Uh, and in it, it talks about the disparity in technology. Like there's a technology gap between the haves and the have nots and it's only getting uh, bigger. So um, this falls right into that. Like I didn't even, even think about that because I, I I went, it's, it's a paradigm shift, right? Like, so when I was a child, we didn't have necessarily um, the internet, right? Like I, the internet came on a disc when I when I made it to high school. Like now my kids don't even understand. Like I talk about things, they like, what are you even talking about? Like the, the, the internet noise, they like, that's a meme to them. Right? But no, that's a real thing. Like <laughs> when your dial motor modem would scream at you as it dialed in things. If I picked up the phone, it would hang up uh, you know, my my uh my internet connection. It was like, what? What's a what's a what's a landline? <laughs> I'm sorry, Ryan. I, just, I I have to say the first time I went to someone's house who had a cable modem, I I thought it was magic. I yeah. thought I thought he was scamming us. I was like, no, you got these pages loaded in cash. There's no way it's that fast. <laughs> right. He's, he's using like, um, what was it? It was a net zero. He used to cash pages. Uh -huh. So because it, it was faster internet that way. Uh, man, it's crazy. We, we are definitely old. Um, but yeah, no, so that, that's a great initiative. And then, like you said, the grant process helps to to um, on-ramp these these companies. So, uh, you know, shout out to North Carolina for making it happen. Hopefully, this uh, is an initiative in other rural areas. Um, my area of Florida used to be rural. It's no no longer right. Like they they've they're they're building a car wash in every corner. It's crazy to me. Like that's the thing. I don't know why. But to say a uh, few counties over, they are a little bit more rural still. Um, but they they do have access to broadband, right? So um, it's not as pervasive here. But I can see in a, in the North Carolina, or as you get closer to the to the heartland, right, where things are fur, uh, further and further apart. There's a lot of money that has to be invested in order to build that infrastructure, and like Shannon said, if you if you're a town of five thousand, why is Google coming there, right? No, oh, yeah. To what end? Um, no, so you look at you cool. look at someplace uh, West Virginia, um, or any other kind of um, 
not only is it the the poverty level but it's the hills oh yeah like so your options are are immediately dropped even mobile um service is a challenge no that makes sense yeah uh was it charleston west virginia i think i think that's uh in west virginia um yeah i had no cell service i was there for a week and they would reach my family <laughs> like <laughs> There's just no connection up there, which is uh, pretty crazy. But no, uh, thank you. Thank you um, again uh, for, for coming on the show. Uh, we're going to have you on for Friday episodes. So definitely continue to tune in throughout the week. If you haven't heard Monday and Tuesday's episode, uh, we have some really good topics. So uh, definitely tune in for those as well. Uh, hit up the show um, by our uh, podcast name. So you can Google us. You'll find the, uh, the show. We're on every pl podcast platform you can think of. Uh, so if you listen, is this a place that you listen? We're there. Uh, you can have Mike Ware at, uh, I'm going to try to get this right this time, Mike Ware 45 on Twitter. Right. Nailed it. There it is. See, it only took three episodes to get there. Um, you can hit me up personally. I'm at Ry Ry Security Guy. That's R Y R Y Security Guy. You can find me on LinkedIn, Clubhouse, and Twitter. Stay safe, stay secure. <laughs>